everybody, and welcome to a frosty wild ride with Steve. We've got the king of snowboarding, Sean White. He is a cold killer when it comes to competition. And man, what a life he's led. All these Olympic medals, the skull fractures, being on tour with Bam Margera as a kid. And that saying that Tony Hawk felt bad for him. Man, is that crazy. This one's juicy, folks. So strap on and let's get into it. I just built a mini ramp in my backyard. Oh, nice. What size? What are we uh, talking? It's it's like three and a half feet, 16 feet wide. Okay, nice. It's super mellow transition. It's just yeah. fun. 16 is good. You want enough to like lock into yeah. a grind because otherwise you're like, you're, you know, you can't really feel that, you know, getting the Smith grind and then you <laughs> yeah. run out of real estate. And you're like, <laughs> right. Then we should have had Sean come to the skate party. Yeah, yeah dude, next sure. time for sure. All right, dude, we'll dive right into it. Here cool. we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean White. Hello. Yes. Yeah, dude. <laughs> we got the white wild ride sign. Here we go. <laughs> um, man, I, I, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised, thrilled that we got you on here. Yeah, right on. We uh, really do pride ourselves on the most high standards of action sports people you know like in skateboarding we've had tony hawk nigel houston yeah. Sheckler, ryan Sheckler, tory Tori Pudwell, Pudwell yeah. danny these. way yeah. danny. and i think that's it okay <laughs> you Dude, know, I'm, like, in the, I'm in the mix yeah, yeah. Travis pastrana <laughs> travis pastrana, pastrana yeah, yeah. Uh, rob deerdick oh yeah we Legends. did have rob deerdick yeah. yes nice. in any case like whatever we don't have to you know honk our own horn too much but uh <laughs> but yeah what it's crazy like Icon, you know, oh, like, yeah. uh, it, 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 there's not even, there's not even another name anybody could name of a snowboarder, I yeah. think, in, in a, a household sense. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty wild, man. And there's just so much to talk about. Of course, you've got a, a four part docu-series on yeah. HBO Max. It's just called Max now. Just Max yeah. now. Yeah. And but uh, before we jump, I was going to say, you know, like I, I mean, you're, you're throwing those names. I mean, when I was asked to do the, sh the show, I was like, oh, hell yeah. Because we'd bumped into each other a yeah. few times and like, man, y you know, your your <laughs> entertainment you put out for years and, and, you know, my childhood hanging with Bam and all those guys. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, it was like, I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah, I'd love to be a part yeah. of this. So, yeah. Yeah, wasn't it um, an Adio Shoes video that... Mm -hmm. You and Tony Hawk had a double part, and Bam had a part in the same video. Yeah, yeah. Well, we would go on tour together in like the bus, and it was rowdy. I mean, if yeah, we talked about sure. the the docu series on Max um, called The Last Run, but there's footage of that tour yeah. in there where like those guys definitely like broke me into the skateboarding like they're like it ain't gonna be easy we're gonna like, you know the hazing they're like I, I but in, imagine, a, in a fun way but it was it was you know a rowdy rowdy tour i can't imagine tony hawk gets rowdy you know at the time um you know he had kind of the weight of the world on his shoulders because he was like carrying the tour you know he was his name's on the bus he's got the game <laughs> coming out you know there's a lot yeah. of pressure but was that before the game no it couldn't have been before no the game. but you know game number what two year was or three that? Right, or whatever right. at this point i'm trying to remember i know it was a rarity oh, two, and i was three yeah Maybe i was like a 102 yeah because my mom let me go solo and that was a big deal because she's were like, you? "Well, I trust Tony Hawk. <laughs> yeah. He's got a kid, so he's not gonna like, you know." Uh, she had trust, so uh, I was probably like, "Gosh, I gotta say, like thirteen or fourteen, <laughs> maybe." Right? Yeah, and it was like, um, you know, just watching, you know, those skaters go town to town and just tear it up, and like, not only the skating was insane, but just like. They would go out at night. They, they, you know, right. I'm getting a glimpse of like this kind of like rock and roll sort of tour lifestyle at a young age. Going, wow, this is this is because the snowboarders, I feel like we're a bit more buttoned up, but the, <laughs> but the skaters, at least in my eyes, yeah. Or maybe I was just with my mom for most of the, yeah. you know, my parents, my dad, and right. whatnot. But yeah, it was it was like okay, wow. This was super fun. Um, but yeah, that was a wild time, for sure. I, I think that your skateboarding is criminally overlooked. 
in, mm. in, in, in a lot of sense because I remember that Adio video. Yeah. And it was like, like was that like your, I mean, it was certainly your introduction to me. It was the first yeah, time yeah. I had heard about you. You were doing, I remember 720s for sure. Mm -hmm. Like uh, You won a couple when, golds at X Games, right? Yeah, I mean, I remember Tony being pissed because I learned a 720 before a 540. He's like, it's not how you got. It's not how you do it. You got to start here. You got to, you know, like, well, it just worked better. And, and do I remember um, that you, it was like a method 720 that made it different? Like, yeah, yeah, I would. I because of snowboarding, I knew spins and big airs and stuff like that. Because the half pipe's like 22 feet tall. We right. bump it down to like a 13 foot vert ramp. You're like, oh my god, this is tiny feels tiny right and so you get you know um me being comfortable in the air and so i always said that like my snowboarding brought my skateboarding the size and and, right. and just the, the the magnitude of it you know big jumps so if we hit a jump on a skateboard it's maybe like oh it's like a 12 foot gap you know snowboarding's like a 90 foot jump huge you know right yeah in an arctic blizzard you know and, and then and then i feel like skateboarding brought my snowboarding like the technical aspect like the precision because by the time i got to snow i'm like oh my god the board's just gonna stay on my feet <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, you, could, what could be easier <laughs> if you fall you're falling on snow yeah, well that was it sounds comfy but it's not it's i mean Especially it's icy it's icy yeah those walls and conditions can get pretty brutal or it can rain the night before mm. and it just turns into this frozen like oh it's yeah. it's rough so you found yeah. snowboarding a little bit more easy to progress in i found it yeah i found it easier for yeah for my my overall sort of like i just took to it right away it was easier but skateboarding was always that kind of unsung thing and i'm i'm glad you mentioned that my skate career kind of got overlooked because that was really hard in the documentary because we were trying to balance like mm -hmm. well how much skate how much snow and and i was like man you guys are really we're harping really hard on the olympics and the in the snow stuff but there were like a solid nine years there where i would hang up the snowboard and go be at the top three at every single skate competition for you know that period of time that was a big chunk of time and and now i see people on instagram who was it uh it was Tony or uh, Andy Mack posted something. He's like, this was like one of the heydays of vert skating. It was a clip of me winning one of the Dutour events. And the comment below is like, dude, it's, it's, it's got the same name as that snowboard guy. That's so <laughs> weird. Like, you know, like, no, dude, that's me. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah wow. it was a, yeah, it's a good time. And, and uh, was it always vert skating or like when you were on the uh, like the Boom Boom Huck Jam mm -hmm. Tony Hawk tour, were you hitting the street course? I would a little bit. I got a funny story of when I skated street because when I, <laughs> my first introduction was to ramps. Like I had a YMCA mm -hmm. nearby that Tony would frequent the, the Encinitas. Encinitas yeah, yeah, it was a legendary place. And so I just got introduced to that right away and street skating wasn't really as exciting it seemed you know more redundant and technical and like repetitive like i'm just gonna try this kickflip in the street over and over right. and over where the ramps i'm like oh man i can launch something i can grind I, and there's just like a whole park designated for it and so i really took to that and then my buddies are like come skate street with us i'm like sure at this point i would used pads my whole life so i, I in a <laughs> and we show up <laughs> We show up to the street spot. It's like a four or five stair drop. And all I remember is going, okay, cool. And I like, I ollie this thing or try to kickflip this thing. And I'm not going to make it. So instinctually, like, instinctively, uh, go I go into a knee slide. Oh, I jumped shit. a five foot stair thing onto my knees, and probably in shorts. And everyone looked at me like, oh my God, wh why, why would you do that? Why? I'm just wow. like, knees are bleeding. I'm like, I'm just going to go home. <laughs> That's crazy. You know, it's just embedded in my brain to knee slide um, in a panic <laughs> situation. So that kind of ended my street career pretty quickly. Yeah. That, that's crazy, man. <laughs> um, with, uh, with action sports, mm -hmm. like, it's, I mean, here, I'm trying to articulate this. I, I feel like the, the level of danger is just at a point where people are dying. 
mm. like all of like we like we're losing people from the nitro circus mm. camp like on an alarmingly regular basis it mm. feels like and um you know there's like i, I i've posted uh clips of the, like parkour kids and they're up on like buildings oh my god yeah jump up on buildings they're like just jumping from doing a flip from yeah. one building to the next building they're like hanging from their fingertips yeah. and, and all the comments when i post that is like dude these people are stupid they're, they're like going to be they're going to die like this is just totally idiotic i can't believe it like yeah but then the guy who's climbing up El Capitan with no ropes yeah. wins an Oscar. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. so. There's like there's this disconnect Celebrated. where like some mm. people are taking risks and it's frowned upon, but then like in the Olympics, was it was it 2010 that they increased the size of the half pipe from like 18 feet to mm -hmm. 22 feet or something? Exactly. Yeah. Like, and then at that size, like and and with the sponsors, like. In order to be sponsored, in order to like win anything, like mm -hmm. you have to take these risks. Like it just, do you feel like there's a point at which mm. we got to be like, hey, like step in here and you know, yeah, or, yeah. or what? Like I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to say, just because I think, you know, with anything, there's always a progression. Like F1, the cars are getting faster. Right. They're doing, you know, but they're like, hey, like let's make sure everybody's wearing the, you know, the mm -hmm. flame resistant suits. We gotta get the helmets right. We gotta get. There are safety regulations. Like when I started, helmets were very frowned upon. I can remember a time when it was also frowned upon to have a little bit of help in the bedroom, but not anymore, baby. Now it's just considered a good time to take a blue chew tablet and enjoy that help in the bedroom. What's so helpful about it? Well, blue chew tablets have the same active ingredient as both Viagra and Cialis, but they only cost a fraction of the price. And get this, the listeners of the Wild Ride podcast can get an entire month's supply of blue chew tablets completely for free and only pay five bucks for shipping. Now, why would you do this? Because it really is a good old time, man. My relationship with Lux thrives on Blue Chew, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. I don't think anybody even frowns upon it. You sort out your prescription super fast with the online medical provider on the website. Takes no time at all, and boom, you've got an entire month's supply of Blue Chew tablets on the way. Just make sure that you use that promo code Stevo to do this and find out how much fun it is. BlueChew.com with the promo code Stevo, and all you pay is five bucks for shipping. Jump on this deal. Have fun. Let me know how it goes, and let's get back to it. Right. It was like you're a joke if you show up with a helmet on, and s major sponsors of mine are like, you got to get rid of the helmet. S snowboarding or skateboarding? Uh, snowboarding. Snowboarding. And um, and they're just like, you'll never be in a magazine, you'll never be in a video, and now like you have to show up. They check your helmet at the competition mm -hmm. to make sure it's up to standard for competing. Like it's a mandatory thing. Right. So like things are changing, and you know the 22 foot half pipe. That was a big one in a way that I thought it actually made it a little bit safer just because, um, you know, think about an airplane, you got this big airplane and it's landing on this little runway, you know, the margin for error is pretty, pretty slim where if you get a bigger runway, I can right. throw bigger tricks and bigger, you know, airs, but I have more to land on. I have more to catch. More so, transition. So in a way it got more advanced and a little more dangerous because we're going faster, we're going bigger, but then again, there's more to catch you. And then with the invention of the airbags and the foam pits, that stuff right. really helped progress the sport. But yeah, I think it's like an ebb and flow of, you know, us pushing the limits and then technology kind of catching up or something in the sport changing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know. I always look at it like probably driving to the mountain was car accidents like it's probably the more dangerous to drive to the mountain you know than you Fair. know what i mean you think about the risks that we take every single day just crossing the street these things that happen that you don't hear about you know what i mean right. and so so i don't know it's like a, it's a weird balance of it but definitely watching the sport now and watching the crashes and things like i feel and especially after watching my my own 
you know, documentary series, I was just like, wow, like I got out. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I and I'm in one piece, so that was that was great. Right. What what was that gnarly injury? Like I didn't yeah. get that far in. I had a few. Um, there was there's one that really kind of shook me, my family, and um, the community that we lived in was I crashed with Bob Burnquist, and that was really bad. Oh, on a mega. That was no. I I was 11 years old. It was an MTV Sports and Music Festival. Okay. Were you there? I don't know. So, okay, no. this is way back. I think Jamie Foxx was hosting. <laughs> he showed up with an afro and these huge <laughs> socks and was like skateboarding like a little dartboard, like a banana board yeah. around the vert ramp chasing me. There's like some funny footage that we found digging through the archive, but I was doing a doubles routine with Bob and we collided mid session. And, wow. and I was a la it was a one sided fist fight. I mean, he clobbered me. And so I broke my hand, I broke my foot, and I fractured my skull. Fuck. And then I, you know, I get home and I cruise into school and teacher just looks at me, starts crying. Everybody's like, you know, it was a really, it was a really heavy thing that happened. And what was crazy about it was the reaction of the community we lived in. Cause they're like, oh, you guys got what you deserved. You're doing these sports that we don't understand. And look what happened to your son. Like this was a matter of time before this happened. Not like, cause we knew we don't normally do doubles. You don't normally right. do these things. Uh, it's not like I tried some big trick and took this crash. It was like an accident, but you know, the school <laughs> tightened up on me, like <laughs> leaving <laughs> to go on, you know, trips for competition. Everything kind of got weird. And then, you know, as a family, like, what do you do when you're mo your mom and dad and you're like, God, everybody's looking at us like those terrible parents that now being that young kid. and taking a slam like that. Yeah. Do your parents take a step back and maybe reconsider like letting you go forward into chasing this dream of snowboarding yeah or skateboarding. so i don't want to give away too much of the dog but there's this beautiful interview with my mom where she's she's talking about it. he's like so what do we do now what's next she's like well i just got to get him back on the ramp and they're like Whoa, what that's awesome and and you go you know okay if your kid was in a car accident you're not like let's just get him behind the wheel we got to get him back in there right. you know yeah, like, yeah yeah it's talladega night what are you talking about you know so she really was there to be like i know he loves it because i did i would cry if i couldn't go to the skate park after school it was my punishment like if you don't do the dishes <laughs> you can't go skate tomorrow and i'm like Bleh! scrubbing all the dishes you know so i just truly loved it and and so she knew that if i you know had this you got to get back on the horse and if 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 this one incident like you know kept me from a a, a career and a lifetime love of this sport and friendships and this like everything i was going to get from it she didn't want to prevent that so she actually like helped guide me back into skateboarding i remember the day i was i was at the skate park and i because i i after the crash you know the the cast finally came off i was like i don't know i just didn't want to skate anymore i was over it and she finally convinced me to go to the skate park and i skated up to the fence and i was like i'm over it like i don't ever i don't want to do this anymore i want to quit she's like all right well I paid five dollars for you to do this session, so you're gonna finish the session. And I was like, Fuck. you know what I mean? Like just such a mom comment. Yeah. You're like, well, I paid five bucks, so you're staying. I was like, fine. I remember running over to the vert ramp. I was killing some time, and I bumped into Kevin Staub, um, you know, renowned skateboarder, sure. legendary guy. Yeah. You can spot his hair from a mile away. Um, and he taught me basically backside airs that day. I could only do frontside airs. And I, you know what I mean? That feeling of learning a new trick, I was just sure. like, I was hooked all over again. And so that's what got me back into skating. But, um, but yeah, those injuries are something that's like, it's a hard thing to bounce back from and a hard thing to get not only your physical, but like your mental straight. Especially yeah. a fresh yeah. skull. Yeah, 11. that was rough. And what happened was the... You know, when, when I fractured my skull, the blood had pooled on my forehead and what's called a hematoma. And Oof, like, and yeah. then all the blood settled in my eyes. Ooh. And so I just had these crazy black so eyes for, cried. oh yeah, I look like I cast on my arm and my leg. I like hobbling into class and they just looked at me like, what happened? When Kevin Staub teaches you a backside air, is it like an early grab or a late grab situation? I think it was late grab because I could already... Um, you know, I, I envied another kid that skated at the park. Um, gosh, what was his name? I think Steve, Steve something. Um, he was a bit older than me and he was the sweetest guy ever. Super, super nice. And, but he skated for birdhouse and I was like, 
I hate this guy. <laughs> He's got to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just created this like, you know, I don't want to say enemy, but like someone sure. to rival with because he... I wanted to be friends with Tony. He was already on Birdhouse. I was like, but I remember the way that he all he would ollie before he yeah got to the top sure. of the ramp. But I hit the coping with my wheels, and so that's how I kind of figured that I could maybe start going higher than him because I'm already starting at a at a at a you know a different way. Uh, I guess you could say. But yeah, I I remember learning it that day, and just like that feeling and and then it just opened up this whole new world of tricks for me and and then it just kind of like went from there yeah yeah when did the airbags come in hmm. to the snowboarding and was that all you i seem to think it was all you pretty much most of it was inspired see i was i was learning new tricks just you could basically show up and you go all right today's the day i'm gonna go for this right. thing i'm gonna mm -hmm. i'm gonna wing it um, and what happened was a lot of guys in the back country started doing these double flips and they're doing double flips because in the back country, it's powder. deep snow, it's powder. It's a natural airbag. They can just chuck whatever, you know, make mistakes, but then it's all good. And so there's no real way to replicate that in the half pipe. So I started kind of thinking about it and I had gone to one of those Woodward camps um, where they have the big foam pits for the gymnastics. And then I saw Pastrana trying his double backflips into the foam pit. I'm like, why, the technology exists. Why don't we tap into this and I can learn some tricks? And, and so I linked together with the sponsor and we created this half pipe setup with the foam pit. And it was supposed to be this big secret. And yeah. then it just became this very well-known secret that I was doing it. And so my competitors in an, in a rush to keep up with me were like, they called their sponsors and they're like, well, we can't, I mean, we got to buy foam and ship it out and build a container for it and all these things. And, it, and they're like, well, well, why don't we do this airbag thing? And so that kind of started the airbag trend. And I was a little annoyed. I was like, why didn't I think of the airbag? <laughs> it's like way easier. The blocks were all getting, you know, snowed on and then freezing mm -hmm. overnight. And shit. Oh. Like it wasn't, it so wasn't. So you did a, the bump hit and your competitors did the airbag? Yeah, to combat what I was doing. And I was like, dang, I didn't even think of the airbag. That's oh. way easier, yeah. <laughs> you know? Wow. And, then, and so, but that's how it all started, you know? And, and that was around 2006 for that, uh, excuse me, 2010 for the Vancouver for Olympics. For Vancouver, yeah. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was, uh. Dude, that's crazy, man. Mm -hmm. And that that's it makes so much sense that the foam is gonna freeze. Oh yeah, it'd get wet, it would freeze, you're losing your goggles. And then the worst part is is that, you know, when you go into a foam pit, it's not a pleasant feeling. And when you have <laughs> a board on worst. your feet, like <laughs> you're stuck. Yeah. I couldn't right. get to my feet. So the first jump I go in and that that awful feeling of like you're suffocating like I, the uh -huh. goggles are just over my face yeah. and I'm just claustrophobic in the bottom of the pit like and everybody's sitting there watching for good 15 like oh he can't get out <laughs> and then right. like, you know. Fuck. so then at a, at a certain point Adam my, my dad was just like lifeguard he would just like come unstrap me and pull me out but I became more nervous of the airbag than actually oh, excuse me the foam pit of you know how I was going to end up in it but it's not foolproof I ended up uh, when I was learning the double McTwist, I landed in the foam and the way the foam works is it's, it's like, you know, uh, it, it kicks back, it's springy. And so as I landed in it, I, I compressed and then it started to push back and I, my momentum still carrying me forward. So I felt this like in my ankle. And so I chipped a piece of bone, um, landing in the foam pit hmm. and that's what ended that whole session. I was like, Oh, I can't, I can't ride anymore. It ended the session. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> that, that's so Danny Way esque. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, how many surgeries are, are like? Have you have you done like ACLs and all that stuff? Man, so I really kind of pride myself that my career was really built off me landing on my feet. I've watched <laughs> some docs and talked to Danny and these guys, and like, man, I've had. Like I had the bad accident when I was a kid, so it was a broken hand, foot, and then the skull. That's and then, not really a joint. Yeah, that's not like a thing. And so I think it wasn't till I was 16, I had a small tear in, in the lateral side of my meniscus, which is the padding in between um, right. in your knee that keeps you kind of Is that what happened to Isaac meniscus? 
Um, I think so. Yeah. Out of all the knee injuries, that's the lesser ACL. evil. That's that's the one you want because it's like they can come in, they clean it up, and right. you're good to go. Where the other ones, you either have to reattach a, a, a ligament or tendon, or you have to get a cadaver. Right, you and know hope what? it takes. Yeah, Isaac got the cadaver. It's an ACL. ACL Isaac did. Yeah. yeah, so that one luckily I didn't have to deal with. And then I, I like, I like ripped a ligament, my thumb, uh, a lot of concussions, unfortunately. And then, um, and then the big crash in New Zealand where I kind of ripped my face open, which really sucked. <laughs> that one was yeah. brutal. But that was kind of it. The, oh, and the chip bone in the ankle. That was about yeah. it. For the for a whole career doing this, that was pretty great. Yeah, that's um, epic, dude. Yeah, I felt very fortunate because, you know, there are, yeah, you know, you talk to anybody that rides motocross or whatever. Football players, just like, dude. oh, I just mm-hmm. shattered this or this exploded. And you're like, oh. Yeah, I, yeah, I was talking to an ex-NFL football player yesterday. Yeah. And I told him that I've never had any knee surgery. Mm. And he was like, his head exploded. Like, he's like, Wait, what? Really? Like, yeah, man. Like, uh, yeah. been very, very lucky with with joints. I mean, I had my ankle screwed together with okay. the compound fracture. It's so funny. Like, well, there's I, that. Yeah, <laughs> the collarbone. Yeah, I screwed. I got a hard Golden knees, collarbone. but just glass ankles. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think a lot of us are strong in some areas and weak in others. And if your weak area involves a smelly, stinky, terrible habit that you want to drop. The good news is fume, baby. What's a fume? It's a diffusive device which helps you replace bad habits with good habits. This diffusive device, it flavors air. I have it in my pocket all the time because I just love the flavored air with the core in there that flavors the air. You want to replace dangerous chemicals, and addictive drugs with flavored air. It's a healthy move, and you know you got to drop that nasty habit. So go to trifume.com and use the promo code Stevo to get 10% off your journey pack. Why is it called a journey pack? Because it's your journey to a healthier, happier, and less ashamed you. Don't do it with the bad habit anymore, man. Drop the shame. Pick up the fume by going to tryfume.com and using the promo code Stevo for 10% off your journey pack. I always have it in my pocket. You can ask me, and I will. If I don't, I'll make a shout-out video for you. Tryfume, baby. Tryfume.com. Now let's get back to it. <laughs> the, uh, I, I was... Uh, He'll never dance. <laughs> I, I, I shattered my ankle with yeah. uh, Danny. W- I was I was trying to do a boneless off okay. of a wooden porta potty, uh, like while Danny Way crashed a car through. I think I've seen footage of this. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. so Danny Way's crashing the car through yeah. it. Tony Hawk's over here shooting it on his phone. Yeah, yeah. I want to stick this thing so bad because we've already like crashed three porta potties and we're on the last one yeah and i'm not even on the board but in my head i'm like i'm just gonna stick it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I just try to stick it and boom, shatter my ankle my foot's coming out sideways yeah and uh you know danny's there he's like dude gotta bring you to my surgeon like yeah <laughs> like, yeah danny's got a surgeon on just call him up pre-vite. hey we got a <laughs> dr previte yeah, yeah no and, and, i i i'm definitely was like your key demo at that time <laughs> for those videos i was like All right, let's go you know but i always remember not to knock it in any way but i always remember having to it was always a thing i was always struggling to keep my sport in a place of like athleticism and this sure. is a, this is a totally. career path for other kids and like because it was hard for me to get through school to do these things and so when the jackass movement happened and all those things like obviously there was skateboarding in it but somehow it kind of got wrapped up into like oh this is what you do as well and i'm like no okay. no no, no, no. Right, like right, right. it's a lot different you know what i mean and and I remember at times being frustrated because I wanted to legitimize my sport as much as I could. Right. And it was hard to, to hard at the time because the video releases would come out and you guys would be doing some wild stuff. And they're like, well, why can't you come on the talk show and do those things as oh, well? Oh, wow. I heard you yeah, say that. And it that was tough. Like, 
You know, if we want you to wear your goggles on stage, and we're gonna slide you in. Yeah, and, and, yeah. You know. So like, but I would do fun things. Like I'm game. I'm not a stiff. Right. I'd be like, yeah, like if it's for this, cool. Let's go do that. Like we we did like a slime rodeo out and wherever with some right, of the right. folks, and like we did some stuff, and I was all for it, and I was like hyped. You guys yeah. were crushing it, but I remember at the time like after my first Olympics, it was rough. They're like, so cool. Like we're gonna like get we're gonna get the stage hands with a bunch of buckets of snow we're gonna slide you on stage we're gonna throw the snow at you and then you sit down and pop your goggles off open up a mountain dew and and say this and yeah. i was like what you know what i mean what, what? i'm an olympian God yeah, yeah totally and i was just like oh man and so i i had to start saying no i was yeah. like no right. i won't do that and you're begging to be on you know right. as a athlete you want a certain level of success or at least i did badly to be accepted and to sure. be you know uh, finally on one of these shows and to win an sb or do those things yeah. and so and then it was like kind of soured by hey what stunt can you do and right. so finally you know i just kept saying no 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 and then finally somebody was like okay come on i was like all right so i like wore a suit i walked on I played the video. I was, I was, you know, whatever cordial I was, you know, made the jokes. It was great. And then that set the tempo for how you see me, you know, which is interesting. Cause I like, I love Tony. He's the man, you know, but whenever you see him, he's holding a skateboard. Yeah. It's, it's inseparable. I think he's got a thing where he likes that. He's like, well, I've got a thing where I've skateboarded on every stage in the world or something like he's right. got like a tally going, <laughs> like he wanted to skateboard out at the Oscars. This last go, or maybe not the last, but the one before. Oh yeah, but he was all messed up. Yeah, he was all messed up. Mm -hmm. He was all hurt. But anyways, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to be. You know, you learn a lot from watching. I was like, gosh, I don't want to be the guy that has to like carry my snowboard out on stage every right. time. You know, and so a lot a of little... that kind of thing. Yeah. Clicked in my head when I was younger of like, wow, this is that moment where you have to kind of decide where you're gonna be, and and I was representing. A much bigger group than myself because you're like no you're the snowboarder so whatever you say at this point goes i was the most like how old were you at guy. that point 19 yeah so that's a kind of a weird thing to go through at 19 because you know like yeah i grew up really quick i mean a lot of my friends at 19 were just like being punks having fun right. you know what i mean and it was like oh no i should put the suit on and go like yeah. represent my sport on television you know yeah, wow. it seems so it was like, weird it seems like that was a good call on your part because i remember walking through target and seeing like all the sean white line of stuff and like yeah. it wasn't you holding a snowboard like yeah. it was like legitimately just sean white mm -hmm. like just your name and you're you're a person and mm -hmm. you weren't like um uh, kind of pigeonholed into like yeah. something where you know yeah. so there, it seems like a, a smart move yeah and I, I it's not like i wanted and i woke up one day like oh this is what's up and this is how i have to conduct myself in business and these things but it just kind of happened over time where <clears throat> i was signing autographs at one of the x games and i rode for a beverage company and i remember getting the poster and i looked horrible in this <laughs> i'm like cold my face is red or whatever you know what i mean it's just like a terrible image but the but the product looked like you could just grab it off the page you know and just drink <laughs> that thing like the, the the you know um condensation on the on the can uh and i remember thinking to myself like god like how can i can i get approval over these things can i at least weigh in or whatever and i remember talking to my agent at the time and i was like he's like oh you want the right of approval of your ads and things I'm like yeah i want that i want to be involved i want to and that just started like well now that i'm involved and we won't sign a deal now unless i have this then now going forward and then i got swept into like well how am i portrayed and how am i so when you went into target and saw those signs and those ads i had gone through countless photos and we picked the one that was like oh this best represents me the product looks you know That's what I great, mean? and and what was cool about it is like you know it's a tough sport it's like you're a sellout you're a yeah you're, he's mm -hmm. not core sure. anymore you're whatever and like i was like well look like man like i shopped at target my parents like we didn't have a ton of cash so there's like affordable stuff and we go to target and we buy the stuff and so when we were there it was like oh this makes so much sense and it wasn't like i was wearing target clothes it was like my design stuff at target that's cool so it was always kind of like a couple layers of you know thought that went into it before doing something like that but yeah i only buy clothes at target yeah to this day. <laughs> nice. and sure. and uh, it's so interesting that you say that because it 
it's not even about if you're core or if you're it's just about like if you're successful people are gonna hate on you mm-hmm yeah it, it's really that simple you it know? was a hard pill to swallow when you're young too because you're like right. wow they just don't dig me because of this or like there's this you know sort of image going around that people are saying this and how do you combat that and and, and I feel like at that age, you just want to be accepted by everybody. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And think of this. I mean, at that point, I'd, I'd only known life traveling in a van with my parents from competition to competition. And so mm, I went pro at 13. All my competitors are like mid <laughs> to upper 20s. So I'm like, yeah. I'm like trying to talk to them, explain Pokemon to them while they're playing quarters. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And like, <laughs> like, I'm like, uh, okay, this isn't good. There's a miss here. Um, and, uh, you know, and so I finally go pro and like, I'm just kind of like the kid on tour. And then finally, by the time I reached a certain age, my competitors and I were butting heads because we're competing against each other, you know? And then uh, I think Tony said something once that kind of tripped me out. He's like, yeah, I always kind of felt bad for Sean. I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, because he, he never really belonged in the skate world because of the snowboarding stuff. And, you know, and he had a hard time fitting into the snowboarding world because he was so young. And, that, you know, and he was just like, and I, I, I never really thought about it until he said that. And I was like, oh, wow. He, you know, it struck like a weird chord from my <laughs> childhood. I was like, oh, yeah, he's right. <laughs> like, you wow. know, so it was a weird sort of, you know, dance to be in. And I never lived in the mountains. So I was my whole career. I grew San up at Diego. the beach. Yeah, I had asthma. I hated the cold. And so, like, when we found snowboarding, I was like, oh, this is cool. I didn't realize you had to go to, like, Norway and Sweden, <laughs> like, you know, I, I feel like Alaska. that is a good, a good business move because, like, isn't there, like, a curse for Olympians that, like, once they hit the Olympics, there's not really a lot of places for them to go after? And After. So, like, yeah. were you aware of that? And it's, like, strike while the iron's hot? Yes and no. I know. I remember that. The Olympics wasn't an option, and then all of a sudden, around 15, or just before I was 15, it was Nagano, they had, um, for the first time ever, snowboarding, and it was more of like an exhibition than a, you Was know. that 2006? No, that was two before that. So 2002 was Utah, uh, the Salt Lake City Games, and so it was the one before that in Japan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we watched on TV, I was like, wow, this is crazy, and then when it kind of became an option for me, they had a thing that said that if you'd made the Olympic team, the Olympic team would cover like, um, I forget what it was, like six years of college tuition. Oh, cool. So that was like a real like, well, hey, if I could just make the team, I got a backup plan. You it's know, a master's degree. Yeah, you could go, you could go, you know, and, and they'd pay your way. And I was like, oh, this could be cool. Okay, so at least there's that going. Um, but I already really knew what I wanted to do and I had success in the sport, but, um, but yeah, it was like, a, it was an interesting time. Um, but I, I think, I don't know if it's as much as a curse, it's just like some sports, like it's just hard to break out. I mean, you're either on a team or you're an right. individual and like kind of who cares after the Olympics mm -hmm. and like, right. it's like a, it's a weird dance. And I feel like the sport of snowboarding and skateboarding already had its own ecosystem yeah. where if you're throwing the javelin or you're doing something, and I, 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 hopefully I don't get a lot of javelin hate coming my way after this. I don't know. Maybe they do have an ecosystem that's abundant. I have no wow. idea. But I'm just saying that, like, yeah, some people tend to just go back to their normal jobs and mm -hmm. normal lives. Right. Like, it's like a, I, I would agree with that. If I was going to say if there's a curse for the Olympics... Um, because I, I knew a lot of like highly competitive platform divers. Mm. I went to the University of Miami and uh -huh. even though I dropped out and failed out, I, I went back and I was just kind of homeless living on the campus of the mm. University of Miami mm -hmm. and, uh, couch surfing around there. Like I befriended the, the, the dive team yeah. and it's just an Olympics factory yeah. and like I would be sleeping on the floor of this student athlete apartment that had the number one, the number two, or the number three NCAA ranked mm. platform divers, one of which was the senior national diving champion. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they're like, it was just all about the Olympics and all about, you know, like all mm. the, this whole thing. And one of their uh, buddies, an older friend, uh, I think it was in Barcelona, because it went Barcelona and then Atlanta, I think. So, uh, I mean, whatever it was, maybe it was Atlanta, 
but this guy won a medal mm -hmm. and he went insane you know oh. like he went insane like and it was described to me like his career blew up and everyone well, knew him or he just himself no it was went. just like where do you go from there yeah oh yeah you know yeah, where yeah. do you go from there like it was described to me that for olympic athletes like they've they've trained it's all they've known it's mm -hmm. all they've, they've got this one goal this one like thing and it's yeah. all, their whole life is about that and and they they it's like the only thing more devastating than not making it or not winning it's actually winning. winning yeah because when they hang that that medal around your neck it was described to me as like imagine it. it's like they're hanging the the end of your life around your neck yeah, this yeah. is like they're hanging the pinnacle of your achievement yeah. and now it's all downhill from here in a in a uh, I'm sorry. It, it, <laughs> would you say that's kind of like the feeling you had when you would go to the red carpets for Jackass movies? I said that was uh, the thing. Like yeah, when when yeah. I went to the when I went to the red carpet for the Jackass number two movie, I was like, man, we're never gonna beat this movie. Like <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. They, we're never it's gonna all beat downhill. this. Like <laughs> this is as good as it's ever gonna get. And I was like, just like I, I felt like this red carpet like represented like. You know, my the the end, the top, yeah. and then I'm, I'm now I'm over it. Like exactly like that. Yeah. You make such yeah. a good point, and, and like in this like drunken like t like <laughs> scare, like angry, like I pulled out my wiener and peed all over the red carpet because <laughs> I was mad at the red carpet. That yeah. was like uh, it's it. the carpet's fault. It's the natural <laughs> thing to do. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right. And, and I did go into a dark thing there. Yeah, you know. I I, I always kind of describe it to people that <clears throat> if you can't relate to it in a certain way, like the, the most relatable thing would be like Game of Thrones or something or like Sopranos. Or something. You're watching some show and it's been going on for years and you're, and you're like, it's about to end. This is the last season. This mm -hmm. is the last episode. Right. Are you thrilled with how the episode ended? Are you, wow. uh, are you frustrated? Are you... Like, look at the the hate that came after Game of Thrones. And they're like, that was right. the ah, yeah. ah, you know, be the blah, blah, blah. people's heads are exploding. So but, but like, at least you know, say you go to the Olympics and you you lose, you're like, well, next season will be better. I bet that main character is going to come back and win it. I bet they're going to turn it around. And like, so you have this identity that's swept up in it. But when you win, you're like, well, I hit it. And is it everything that I'd hoped it would be? Is it everything that people told me it would be? And in many ways it is. In many ways it's not. I mean, you probably had more recognition than you'd had in your life. Right. You're not couch surfing anymore. You're, you know sure. what I mean? But then again, you're like, well, now what? Like, do I just go find another show and get mm -hmm. attached to another main character? Like, how do I? And you don't want to. You're like, well, wait. <laughs> So there's right. there's this conflict, and then a lot of it is this like prolonged happiness or delayed happiness. You know, a lot of things that bring about happiness or fulfillment take a little time, also known as un poco tiempo. Why do I know that? Because I've been learning Spanish with this great new service called Babbel. And man, it can get you having conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. And, you know, it's like playing a video game on your phone. Everybody loves being on their phones and everybody loves playing the video games. But this is like a video game that teaches you a whole new language. And that's one of the most valuable things you can possibly do in this life. Plus, just like 15 hours of playing this babble game, learning the new language, it's the equivalent of an entire semester of a class teaching you another language in a university. Plus, with the Babbel Live, now you've got actual live interaction with the certified foreign language teacher. I'm telling you I love Babbel. And if you go to babbel.com, that's B-A-B-B-E-L.com, slash stevo you get 55 percent off your subscription now do you want to be a loser for the rest of your life who only speaks one language i don't that's why i'm learning a new language on Babbel. so one more time go to babble.com slash stevo to enjoy 55 percent off your subscription what a deal man jump on it now let's ride this out now i didn't i didn't 
I learned a lot about this later on in life. You know, I've, I've done a lot of like work on myself and talk to people and whatnot. But like, you know, you realize that you're like, well, if I could just do this, then I'll be happy. Yeah. Right. If I could just once I win the Olympics and I have the recognition right. and the success, then I'll be happy. Sure. I'll be I'll be complete and right. at Zen or whatever you're picturing. It's like one gold yeah. medal is too many and totally. a thousand is not enough. Totally. <laughs> and so like, yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's probably yeah, really yeah, like, yeah, so sure. I got one like and, so you, yeah, yeah. and then you win and you're like, well right. shit, Michael Phelps got a lot of these uh -huh. things. I got to right. how do I beat this guy? And I'm like, he's got more more events than I do. How do I compare? How do I show that I'm the best ath right. athlete Olympian ever? Maybe right. I'll do slope style and half pipe and Jesus. I'll do this and I'll be in a band and I'll, you know what I mean? Right. You start like. <laughs> Why'd you think about going into a band? Oh, yeah. Oh, I band. did, oh, yeah. yeah. I won a guitar at a snowboard contest and I just fell in love with playing and I was just like, it was just kind of a side thing. So if you, in the doc, like, there was like a fun project that I'd been, you know, in a band with friends. And so after the one Olympics, the plan was because you get the <laughs> post Olympic blues, you're like, well, what now? Like, right. we just talked yeah. about the season's over. Or the show's over and you're like now what and so we had planned to go on tour and that was such a saving grace because i had lost and i was like well look at these friends i have look at this life i still have i'm still good as me without the win or without people calling for the appearances and whatever and so that was like a big kind of realization in my life is like I didn't, I didn't realize everything until I had lost, mm. you know what I mean? Which is so funny to, to think about. And, and when I talked about it, I was like, that was actually one of the happiest times of my life. Cause like the expectation was gone. I was just like kind of settling in this, like, well, what next? And I realized that like all of my accomplishments from before weren't erased, you know, like we'll forever be able to watch your right. films and be like, fucking, that was a moment in time. And that was right. so funny. Yeah. And I'm sure you're doing great. You know, that yeah. you got this going, you got other things, but that was a moment in time and that doesn't just go away. That was, that's embedded in like people's childhood and that affected them. And it, yeah. you know, I remember cracking, you do with my buddies, like, did you see that? Like I would look forward to it. And so, so yeah, that, that lasts forever, you know, and that's so cool. But like in your mind, you were like, well, fuck, it's over. I know, dude. It's and over. It, now I, what? You know, it's I'm, hard. I'm really glad that Vinny brought that up because it was so real to me. Like it was so devastating. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, like I, it was this just like, uh, and, and I think of it now and it's like, Man, my life is so much better now. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like running circles around that kook that was filming that movie. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, and uh, damn, it's just it's just nuts. Yeah. Um. So you had the Olympics that that you lost, mm -hmm. and and you were were you like officially retired, and then you came out of retirement. So like, my plan was kind of to retire. I was like three golds in the pipe, like I'm good, you know, right. I had the band going, I had things, I had, you know, an amazing relationship I was in, there's all these things going my way, and I was like, okay, like, let's just hit it. You know, I did the like, if I could just win one more, then I'll be happy, you know right. what I mean? I was doing that a lot, <laughs> with a lot of things. And so, um, you know, after that, sorry, sparkling water got me. Um, so did, after did you officially retire, no, not? I didn't. So that was my thing is I was, I was feeling like I was ready to retire and then I didn't get what I wanted. You know, I didn't want to end the season that way or the, the movie or whatever. I was like, I gotta, but then, you know, that feeling of like, okay, if I could just get through this, I'm going to retire. You're kind of running that marathon. You see mm -hmm. the finish line right. and you cross it and realize you didn't win the marathon. You're looking and there's just another marathon. You're like, how do I, how do I you know, get pumped up to do it again. And so I never told anyone that that was just kind of in my head. Um, right. but then, um, yeah, I like dug deep. I like changed a lot of things in my life and just kind of started plotting the course to that next Olympics. Yeah, and that I, was the 2018. Yeah. I, I, I seem to recall that it was like, it felt like a surprise that mm -hmm. you were competing again. Yeah. Well, playing music and doing those things right. really sends a message that you're over it. So right, right, right. <laughs> sponsors, people, things, everybody kind of went like, oh, he's off, you know, sailing his boat into the sunset. You right. Know? And and you hadn't won the Olympics before. So it was like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. like it's Sean White's in it, you know, like. Well, I, I usually take the year after the Olympics off, no matter what, just because it's too much to jump back in. I tried that when I was younger and I just was right. like left with this like awful feeling because yeah. you know i just i was like i need time to 
to chill. And so with the music and those things, and so when I came back, people were just kind of like, oh, like, does he still got it, you know? Right. And, and can he perform at these levels? And um, yeah, there was just like a lot going on in my world at that time. And I, I remember using that as motivation because I was like, well, if they don't think I can do it, then perfect. I'll show right. them. I'll yeah. show everybody I can. You know what I mean? And, and you seriously which was, showed them that. Which time, was right? cool, but then again, for the old mental well being, like it wasn't a, it wasn't like a happy comeback. It was like I gotta, Whoa. you know. And you're you're drawing from this pool of you know um, motivation, and some of that had run dry for that previous Olympics where I didn't didn't succeed, and and so. Um, and so I was really like put to the test with this really big crash that I had yeah. in, what, in New Zealand. What's yeah. the difference in like training time? Like when you're going into the Olympics, are you training for like 12 hours a day versus like if you're doing an event yeah. at a local mountain, it's like, okay, I'm going to train a couple hours a day. Yeah. Like how different is that training? Well, it's changed a lot. I mean, I would just go when I was younger. And then as you get older, you're like, okay, well, maybe there's a smarter way to do this. And then it got it boiled down to like, hey, I'm good for like two hours is probably my window. Mm. Like I show up, I warm up, I'm, and I'm the best I'm gonna be throughout the day. And then by the second or third hour, I'm starting to, you know, I'm just not as sharp, I'm yeah. getting fatigued. I, and when you're fatigued and like, I don't know how to describe it, if you're doing that last bench press, you know, and your yeah. buddy's there to help you pull the weights, so you, mm -hmm. you don't have that, you're like 30 feet up doing whatever, right. and if you're off, it can be sure. detrimental, it can be very, very bad. And so um, I would just do these power windows and then I'd go home and be like, well, now what? <laughs> and so that, that became an issue too because the downtime, I'm like, well, now I'm just here in Switzerland, which is beautiful, but there's no, like we're off season, this restaurants aren't open, there's no one, you know, it's not like my family could come, my girlfriend, anybody could be with me. So I'm just kind of like in the doldrums of just waiting for the wind to pick up and I can go <laughs> ride again the next day. And you do that for like a month or two and you're just like, Ugh. So that's a, that's the grind of it, you know, mm. keeping the mental. Because if you show up, you're not motivated to throw down, then why are you even there? So you right. got to kind of balance this thing. That's where guitar and other things came into my world because, like, well, I got to kill time somehow. Yeah. Right. What does training look like? When, it's not just all snowboarding. Are you doing like weightlifting? Are you doing like cardio? I, yeah, I claimed it pretty hard when I was younger. Like, I, I, I said that I worked out, but I definitely didn't. <laughs> I was like, I was like, dude, we're taking the chairlift. I'm going downhill, like, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so no good. one else is hitting the gym. Like, why would I? And I was winning, so it wasn't like I felt <laughs> compelled to like get in there and start pushing some weights around. Um, At least stretching, though. I was stretching a bit. I had read an interview of Andre Agassi that says he doesn't stretch before he competes so i was like well i don't and andre does, does it then i don't need to stretch yeah, so neither does tony i stretch after is, <laughs> is a thing so yeah because like it's the whole like you don't want to get your you know leg or muscles to the breaking point right. and get too loose which was why bob burnquist tripped me out because he would just stretch like crazy right but and then go skate but um but yeah, I would always just kind of like do a dynamic warm up or something to get warmed up and then go ride and then stretch heavy after. But yeah, I had physical therapy and, and those kind of things. But then around, it was after Sochi, I started working out actually on a regiment and it wasn't to get stronger. It was just because I knew that my mental wellness would be better. I knew that after completing a workout, I was happier because I felt like I accomplished something. So I was like, well, I should just work out because it'll make me happier. <laughs> it was everything was like, well, what's going to make me happier? What's going to make right. me? Because the reasons why I lost weren't physical. You know what I mean? I had the winning run. I felt like the highest score of the night was my qualifying run. I'm like, why don't I do the right. easy run? You know, like it, it wasn't that. It was something mental that was keeping me from succeeding. And I wish it was physical. It's way easier to go do a bunch of sit-ups than to go like fall back in love with something or someone or, you know right. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the thought of that's really hard. And I was like, well, how do I start? And so I started picking apart things that just like were upsetting me. I was like, how am I being portrayed on Instagram, uh, portrayed, excuse me. You know, like how are people viewing me on social media? Right. How am I being looked at in these ads? Do I like who I'm working with? Like, <laughs> do I do like is my manager great? Is this people good? Is this you know I haven't spoken to my brother in a long time. I haven't, you know, like just mm. those are the things that I started to 
change in my life, nothing to do with snowboarding. And then once I came back to the sport, I was just like a happier guy on the board. That's wow. cool. And I was like... I mean, when I think of Sean White, like, I, I think of you as like, you know, people describe you as like a robot, like yeah. just insane, <laughs> like, like this, this, like literally like almost just mentally ill like competitor you know uh -huh. that's just like got to win like yeah and, and and it makes me think like that whole drive to just be the best and i have to win and like mm -hmm. um it i i can't relate to that at all except when i think about how the question are you happy mm -hmm. always bothered me so much like if mm. somebody ever asked me are you happy? Mm. Like it would just, and, and I couldn't even put a finger on it. I just knew I didn't like it because my my natural thought is no, no, I'm not happy. Like not, not, nothing. Like I, I would, I would just. Was think, it that you had to put on the face for the camera and be like, yeah, I'm so thrilled. Well, no, it was just <laughs> or like, was I, it? It's like yeah, like just to anybody. In, oh, in, just in, in any general. Setting, okay, in any okay. setting, ask me if I'm happy, and it's like I'll just kind of scan my my my, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of think about it, and like nothing tells me that I'm happy, and so the question would bother me. It would feel like yeah. in, invasive. It would just feel rude. Like mm. how dare you ask me that? Like because because the honest answer is no. Yeah. And and I spent a lot of time thinking about that and like why does it bother me so much and why do i feel like i'm not happy hmm. and uh and, and i come to realize that like there's just something about me where my default setting is that like i'm not okay everything's not gonna be okay hmm. like i've got to like hurry up i've got to frantically scramble and hustle to strive and to accomplish so hmm. that somehow everything might be okay hmm. and it leaves me in a perpetual state of just anxiety and stress mm -hmm. and like constantly feeling like I've got to do something, I've got to like mm -hmm. get something done and that's why I'm not happy. Mm. But then the more I think about it, it's like, all right, well, let's say, let's say if I was happy, like, what does that mean? You know, mm -hmm. like content. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, dude, that sounds dangerously close to lazy, you know? Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And, then I, and I get to the point where like, you know what? Oh I arrived at my final answer. It's like, no, I'm not happy. And I don't want to be happy because happy is lazy. And if I had a choice between my like perpetual stress mm. and anxiety or being happy, happy dude i choose the hustle yeah man. but why can't you but why can't you, can you be happy both. and hustle at the same time i mean i just don't like i don't like can't turn it off but i don't have the switch yeah that's a, that's a hard one to find but that's the goal it's for it's, sure it's uh you know success without fulfillment is the greatest failure you know with, without enjoying the ride to getting there and you're just uh, by the time you get there you're not enjoying you're like well i got what i wanted but it's not what I right. thought I needed and, and, and there must be more, there must be that next thing. And, and I've suffered from that as well, for sure. I mean, you set these new goals cause you're like, well, right. I'm not, I'm not happy. There must be this level right. of happiness that I just haven't achieved yet. Yeah. Um, but like the ruthless sort of, you know, machine, the competitor, like that's for sure a part of me. But that's not like me, you know what I mean? Like it's what I do. Like I love it. Like you get in the <laughs> right. if you get in the halfway, the goggles come down. I like I want. I'm out for blood. I want to win. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was kind of the first to kind of wear that on my sleeve in a sport that was like, no, oh, we're all here just to have fun and like, my, right? It's sunny out and it's great. And you know, I'm like, no, nah, dude, I really want to win. I'm like, I've been, I'm working really hard at this. And <laughs> any other sport, it's like, oh yeah. Guy right. wants to win. Sweet. Right. I love it. But yeah. for snow snowboarding, it was like, what a what an ass. You know what I mean? And and so it was really strange. And I just remember kind of like navigating these waters where I'm like watching the Lakers and the Celtics play. And 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 then they're like, should you go out to dinner with the guys after the comp? I'm like, I don't know. Do the Lakers and the Celtics go grab a beer after? <laughs> That's it. Hell point. no. Good you know point. what I mean? They're yeah. out for blood. And I love it. there's respect, for but sure. there's not that, you know, and, and so... And not that that's what it was like for me. I did have like a cordial, you know, it wasn't like just, just daggers sending vibes at the top of the half pipe. It was, dude, I'm joking around. We're having fun. We're messing with each other. And then the goggles come down and it's on. Yeah. And like, I'm just intense when it's time to be intense. Like if I'm training, I'm like, I show up, I do my warm up, and I start throwing my tricks as hard as I can. And then I get the hell out of there. But I lived these two lives. So like, 
by day, you know, whatever I was, or, you know, the, the kid that like walked to school, I played handball. I like, no one cared about snowboarding in my community, but by night or whatever, the superhero had come out and I was like Sean White, the like prodigy snowboard kid. And I had sponsors. I was excitement. I was in magazines. I was like, so a lot of that grew over time, but I, I was able to kind of keep the separation. And so now that I'm older, like I definitely, I know that's a big part of me. And, and a lot of the TV programming that you see about me really harps on that right. side of things because it's the ESPN interview. Like we want to get to right, the bottom right. of the killer. We want to mm. understand what makes you tick. But there's a rarity that goes into the other side, which is why I was so thrilled about the dog. Because you get to see the family, the right. family road trip. Like, dude, I, I had a blast. I was doing right. all these things. But, yeah, there was that side of my life that was like, you know, I want to succeed. I want to prove that my sport is more than just a fad. And I want right. to be able to, you know, hang my hat on this, you know, life and career that I made a change. I did something different. And, um And so a lot of that kept going. And then, like you said, like even more detrimental, I actually won my first Olympics. I was 19. I'm like, oh, my God. So that's it. Game, game, right. set, match. Like it's over. Like okay, no, this there must be more. And dude, not so only so you just did keep you... raising the bar, but yeah. So sorry, I interrupted. I, no, I, please. I really, I, I'm, I've been working on this, but <laughs> I'm so excited about this. Not only did you win your first Olympics, yeah. but like you, you won it with like your first run mm-hmm. of like the competition. Yeah, yeah. So you get that first run in, and then it was all of the competitors follow you mm-hmm. and and their scores come in and nobody matches your score mm-hmm. so then by the time you've done your second second run it's you already won fun. It. yeah i was at the top they're like and he won it and you they're can, like all you, right go you have, you have another run you <laughs> victory just, lap yeah you can go right down the middle of the half pipe just, just yeah you don't have to do anything yeah and, and then that's when you're throwing your gnarliest stuff so for the first olympics i was just like oh my god i want you know i did it this thing and I didn't fully understand the magnitude of the Olympics. You're the best I mean, in the world. I thought that yeah I mean I was like oh this is cool <clears throat> I did it. Did mom dad proud or you know what I mean like USA the team's biggest event I won it but like my god did I I came home and it was just I couldn't walk around I, I had huge red hair everyone spotted me I was walking through like JFK airport and the whole like terminal just broke into applause wow. like a, like an old movie, the slow clap, and everyone's cheering, and I'm, I'm courtside at the Knicks game with you know, Regis, and like, like, and yeah, and they're like, put me on the jumbotron. I had the medal in my pocket. I hold it up. The whole place, like Madison Square Garden, goes nuts, and like, you know, it was just my world had just gotten crazy, you know. Um, and if I would have known that before, it would have been a different game. Um, but when we're talking about the victory laps, like. That time I, I celebrated, I did a big slash on the wall. I yeah. did all these things. I came down to the bottom, got the, got the, the award. The next, the Olympics, next Olympics, I was up there. Deja vu, man. Same thing. Put in the first run. Scores come in. No one beat it. I won. And I'm sitting there like, wow. I'd worked so hard to learn these new tricks. At the time, my buddy was like in a coma trying these crazy tricks, and I was like really weary of this this move that I invented called the double McTwist 1260. And I just remember it was like whispered if I was gonna do it or not because at the X Games just before I'd crashed and like hit my face on the wall, my helmet popped off, and um, you know it was it was like, is he gonna do it? It's so dangerous. What what's gonna happen? And I was like, I'm gonna. I don't know. I just always. I idolize guys like Mike Tyson. He, you know, he'd come out in the black shorts and he'd just knock them out right away. Or Muhammad Ali had the, the gift of gab. You had these guys that had this certain style about him. It wasn't just a win. They had to win in a way. And, and I was like, I'm, gonna, I'm going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to best this run. I'm going to do this trick that was really intimidating at the time. And, like, I'm just going to let it all hang out. Now, it could have been... I landed it, thankfully, but it could have been <laughs> replaying it now in my mind. I'm like, I could have been the guy with the gold medal that just was carted off and they're like, right. he won the gold and yeah. then oh he's God. in pieces at them. I don't know why, why back to you, Susan, that, you know, it could have been really bad, but it became a, like a legendary moment where I like, yeah. I just stuck it. I, I did this run. I didn't need to, and right. I just and wanted to, sh- to make my mark in the sport. And that's kind of like. The first Olympics was like, oh, he won, okay. And this was like, I got to cement in this thing that, like, this is what I do. This is my life. This is everything. And, like, I got to show where my level is and, and, and right. make it make a, a lasting impression. And that really, like, that trick got heard kind of around the world. 
Dude, which was insane. pretty wild. Yeah. Insane. When, uh, it, it, I love how, like, you, um, you say that the, the, the whole, like, machine and competitor that, that, that gets harped on. Mm. And, and, and I, I, I certainly believe that to be the case. But my, I just have to believe that it's that same, like, just, you know, attack, you know, win, succeed mentality. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't just have that in snowboarding. You've got to be applying that to everything oh, you yeah. do in your life. Yeah. Business, like, <laughs> you know, like, music, like, whatever. Like, yeah, the way yeah. that you talk about managing your, uh, you know, like, Made your your approval with the photos oh, like you're yeah, like I went yeah. through everything yeah. like you're just I just gotta believe that in every facet of your life you are mm -hmm. highly meticulous strategic and driven mm -hmm. and it's just epic well it, it it it's I always say it's one of my best and worst qualities because I for a long time you know you develop skills as a child and you and I got really good at this sort of like you know try something until you know fail 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 until it succeeds and then and then you know okay well it's not working well, how do i how do i reassess reconfigure everything until it does work and i just got really good at that sort of you know um competitive mindset of like reset figure it out then win and it just kept going over and then and then i got used to this sort of like reward system of like well, when things get really hard, that must mean that there's a reward waiting just along the bend because every time things did get really hard, knee surgery, something, I come back and won the gold or like I rip my face open, come back and win the, you know what I mean? So right. every time things got really hard, I kind of got trained to push through it because something great was waiting just, just in the future for me. Um, but I think as I got older, the hard part is that I, it, that was kind of one of the main skill sets I developed and I got really good at it. But then, you know, you go into life and life's not really like that. Business isn't like that. I mean, in, in some ways it is, but like you can't win in relationships. You can't, you know, it, or if you're going in trying to win, that's a bad way to, you don't want to win right. in, in the relationship with your girlfriend or somebody, or family member. Like I had to kind of learn the new skill sets at a later stage in life, which was really tough because I was like, oh, well, what do you mean? And like, I couldn't understand why people weren't as driven as me, especially right. being in a band or something like that. And like, it's a collaborative thing that actually right. brought a lot of peace to my life because I remember picking up a guitar and I was like, I'm like, I'm going to be the best in the world at this. <laughs> why not? I, <laughs> yeah. I did it with this. I did it with, I can do it with this. And I remember picking up and I watched some, you know, video with Jimi Hendrix and, and uh, Jimmy Page and some uh, amazing guitar players. I was like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> All right. You know, right. but I was humbled in that sense of like, oh, wow, this could be something that's just for fun, you right. know, that I just do. And, um, and then I remember playing a song. It was a Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes. And it was like one string. It said, dun, 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 dun. And I was yeah. like, I was like, it's so simple. Like I always thought music was so complex. It had to be so easy. Right. No, you're just conveying a message. Some of the best songs in the world are so simple. Right. And so that really brought like some peace to my life in that way. But yeah, it was a weird sort of switch that had to happen for me to kind of like realize, um, you know, other, other avenues and skill sets in life. Cause it, it, it's a very motivating thing. It gets a lot done, but it doesn't really give you that completed sort of life you're looking for, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so, so what's life like now the, yeah. like these days? Where are you at? Man, it's great. Um, and I can say that truthfully, it's, it's, it's weird. I look back and now having the documentary come out, it feels like I was able to kind of put a nice ribbon on all of this stuff and yeah. look at back yeah. at the career and go, Oh, this, this was great. There's a moment. Uh, yeah. Look at the story. It's not the whole story, obviously. How right. can you fit, uh, you know, over 20 something year career in a couple hours, but you know, it was when you do have a docuseries like this and, yeah. ha and, and having the, the career that you've had, all the achievements that you've done, mm -hmm. do you look back at some like a project look at this and say, I wish I could have done that differently, or I regret doing this mm -hmm. or anything like that? Or do you get emotional? Oh my God, dude, watching the edits was like, agonizing yeah it was mm -hmm. so hard just because i'm like i'm watching the interview where i say this and i'm like you're lying like i could just see it like, i was like it's wearing on you and you're putting up this front or like 
I'd watch myself just like turn the most like awful situation into this positive thing. And I like, I would just find the positivity out of nowhere. Like, well, I got hit in the face and like, look, I just like, now I know I can take that hit. So look, it's great. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, what yeah. are you talking about? Like, right. And so you kind of see these weird patterns and things, but yeah, it's hard still. It's like I said, it's a part of me. It's hard to look at that competition in Sochi and go, oh my God, I could see so clearly, like, why mm -hmm. couldn't I have done this? Or why wouldn't I have, maybe if I would have signed that deal, I wouldn't have gone there and done this. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so hard to watch it. And I'm such a visual sort of feelings, like I see it and I feel it and I make it happen. And and so watching is like agonizing because it's, it's just me in that place all over again. You know what I mean? I feel exactly how I felt in that moment. So it's hard for me to separate it. So I would go through like a few days of like, being kind of down and out when mm -hmm. I watched some of the edits, even though there were these amazing moments, like especially the last Olympic run, because I'm like, God, I could, if I would have just stepped on the gas a little here, like I clipped the top on that last run, I didn't even get to finish it, like I don't know, you know, and you, you're humbled in the sense because you go like, oh, well, it is what it was, you know, and if you can just sit back as a viewer and watch it's a really great series. It's really enjoyable, oh, you, yeah. you know, but like when I was watching it, I'm like, well, they forgot that, you know, when I, when I crashed the Lamborghini, I got another one. They didn't even talk about it, you know, whatever <laughs> like, <laughs> stupid stuff. You're like, they didn't even, t they didn't even say that I right. did this. Or like my, that one edit didn't even make it in. And I like, you're, you're watching it from this perspective of like trying to get your whole life in this thing and, and really replicate that moment in time and and so it was a really tough experience I'm, I'm thrilled it's over with but but yeah i mean uh, to answer earlier like i mean my days today are just like i'm still just as active i skate i surf snowboard um launched a company with my brother called white space which is really fun we're making outerwear activewear and snowboards goggles all this stuff and now nice. we're out looking for our team because cool. oh, right. when I was a kid, I was sponsored by Burton mm -hmm. and they helped give me product and like gave me travel budget and like this stuff. And so now we're like looking at it's so awesome. Like I, I was getting off a chairlift and this little girl got off the chair with one of my boards. <laughs> and I'm doing my heart sank. I was like, oh my God. I had not seen one of my boards out in the wild before. And I like go up I'm like, hey, what's up? I was like, I got to say something. You can't tell who I am. I'm all blacked out with the goggles, the <laughs> helmet, and the. And she's like, what's up? I was like, I really like your board. And she's like, yeah, thanks. You know, she was so cool. And I'm like, I was like, well, can I get a high five? You know, <laughs> she's like, yeah, sure. You know, but, but it's so sick to kind of see that next generation. And, and, you know, I know what my first snowboard meant to me and to see somebody that age with my board and, and building the team. So that's given me a lot of enjoyment of like being in the sport, but not having to throw myself yeah, you know, that's do great, the big man. tricks, and then, um, and then, yeah, it's been it's been really interesting. You know, I, I talked to a lot of athletes. They're like, "Don't stop working out." <laughs> right. They're like, "The comeback's really hard." So, For sure. right. so I'm still really active doing those things, and then, um, yeah, it's wild. I'm curious, is snowboarding? It's got to be. Like, mm -hmm. like we look at what's going on with skateboarding, and it's the 12 year olds that are oh, doing yeah. 1080s. Yeah, that's like, insane. I mean, these kids are coming out, and and like, like. I don't know how old the, this this like these little girls are that are mm -hmm. like just destroying mm -hmm. on vert ramps and the kids yeah. on the the mega ramps. So are the like is snowboarding like the gnarliest things are happening with like twelve year old kids now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wouldn't say like the top tricks like skateboarding. You're like, oh my god, like a yeah. lot of top pros aren't doing those tricks, and this right. ten year old just showed up and crushed everyone. Like that's not really happening, but tricks that like uh, i couldn't fathom doing a as an adult these kids are doing for mm -hmm. sure that Man. like i created way back when but they're just like oh yeah they got that one now and they're trying this and they're working toward the bigger tricks so yeah like i think the swell has come you know definitely like heavier in that younger generation and like you said the women's department yeah. is like crushing hmm. and so you see a lot more you know, female riders and, and skateboarders. And it's really cool to see. And, and, and I feel like there was such a big gap in the tricks for, for men's and women's. And it's really like closing now. Wow. A lot of the younger female snowboarders are, are crushing and they're trying the big tricks and they're going huge and they're doing it all. And it's, it's rad to see that, that like 
that sort of um, part of the sport is growing dramatically. Yeah, that's epic, man. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, yeah the, um, in Encinitas, mm-hmm. behind uh, what uh, Hanson's, there there was always yeah. this like snowboard oh that machine. carpet thing yeah it's like a carpet yeah. like treadmill what was kind it? Of like snowboard training machine. i don't know what that thing was, that was a yeah. dying to know if you ever got on it i remember <laughs> seeing it as a kid and being like what in the hell is this thing and like i think it was for people to like try out their skis it was basically like a it was like a big treadmill with white carpet on it uh-huh. and you and yeah. they would turn it on and you'd kind of like like make your turns on it but no i don't i never messed with that thing no it was <laughs> and, and then there's like uh like what other like artificial like you know like the, well, like dubai's got one of the biggest indoor parks now i mean they and got so this that's giant, just artificial snow yeah they have these indoor facilities and so right. during covid it was kind of wild i was like oh i can't fly to new zealand where i normally train the borders are all shut i can't get into canada i can't and i was and i was like huh I wonder if I could go to Dubai. <laughs> you know, like maybe they'd let me in, and so we actually sent them renderings and got the schematics of the. Plus, I was like, that would be the most James Bond move of me to be. They're like, where is he? Oh, he's down in Dubai, like yeah. training. Yeah. Fight Island. Wait, Sean's in the <laughs> desert snowboarding. Like yeah. what? You know, and so it actually we had it all ready to go, but the weight of the half pipe and the machine that makes a half pipe wouldn't be supported by the structure down there. So we got that close to doing it. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's some pretty amazing things like that. I know people, people in London and and other places are, they've got these things called the dry slopes. Yeah. So it's kind of similar to what you saw, but it's more like bristly material and they, they're building these big jumps and Hmm. things. And so places in China, I mean, China is exploding with the sport because obviously with the Olympics and the excitement and, and, and um yeah the culture's like really taking on the sport and so you see a lot of people um you know coming out of there with these big big new tricks and wild you know inventions to be snowboarding year round which is really kind of wild to see but yeah mm-hmm. it's getting exciting and and um i don't know i'm i'm thrilled to see where the sport's kind of going to go from here you know it's a trip how about like commentating for the X Games and the yeah, Olympics? Yeah. Are you into that? Or? I don't know. I mean, I've been asked to do it for the Olympics, and I was like, yeah, okay, that that makes sense for me. I'd love to be a part of that, you know, um, just because I know what it's like to be standing up there. It's your first time. Sure. You're wearing clothes that you don't wear normally. You're wearing a gloves that you don't like. Yeah. You kind of shed your identity when you get there. You become right. part of Team USA. Everybody's wearing the same thing. In a sport that's very individual, it's like my music, my style, this is the tricks I do, whatever. Mm-hmm. You become part of this big team all of a sudden. You've never felt that before. So it's a, it's a weird experience. Um, but yeah, so like for, for the Olympics, I definitely would love to do that. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like the everyday event, I don't, I don't know. It's something where... One, maybe it's me, the competitiveness. I'm like, I'd have to be the best at it. You know, I'd have to be so good. And they're like, oh, we got to get him on. We got to get him on the mic. You know, Um, so there's that factor. But um, but yeah, I don't know. I kind of feel like something's going to grab hold and it's going to like, obviously the company's amazing. It gives me that kind of, it scratches that itch of being in the sport, but not really, you know, but I don't know. There's something kind of, I don't know. I feel like will catch my interest and. And, and just like sweep sw- mm-hmm. me up in it, you know. Are you doing music still? I just play for fun. You know, I think right. that was something that like, it's kind of like speaking a language in a way. Like you right. meet people like, oh, well, what guitar do you play? Like, oh, what style? And like, oh, what pick hardness? Yeah. Whatever you, questions you have, but like you kind of can jam together. And you, so I've always loved music in that fashion. But I don't know. I remember talking to some friends that. um played music because the, the the hard part about music is that it's a grind man i mean i thought i traveled but then you go on the road with musicians and it's that groundhog day mm-hmm. of just yeah. like oh what city are we in cool wake up go into the green room try to get some coffee or whatever uh be ready for sound check then it's like you got a few hours to go do whatever and then the show starts and so you got to get ready you play the show everybody wants to party with you after and then by 2 a.m the bus loads up off to the next city and you're just doing that day mm-hmm. after day after yeah. day oh we know about that <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah it's it's a grind it's like it's a whole thing and then right. the radio shows and the things so like you know i think playing music really kind of opened my eyes to yeah there is that 
image of the rock star jet setting and playing the huge venue and get back on the plane or you know, Metallica or whatever mm-hmm. Muse, one of these huge bands. But um, for the average musician, like it's a grind, you yeah, know, and it's sure. it's a thing. And so, um, so I don't know. I, I definitely like I love music, but I don't know if I would I would want to dip back in in the way that I did before. Right. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, where are you spending most Unless, like, of your time? Unless I had a van, I could take around. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah, come sure. to the my show. Yeah. Out, yeah. <laughs> um, is it is it true that uh, like every Olympic person that I met has the, tat- the rings tattooed somewhere on them? Oh yeah, yeah. I know. I know a few that have. I don't. You don't, I don't have that. I don't so it's not like a it. thing that you no. you made or the Olympics. I, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, just, um, I always thought that like they 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 would. They're yeah, they're yeah. Do yeah. It. I remember <laughs> thinking about doing it. But right. I never oh, got to it. But a lot of people it. have yeah. it, or, or yeah, it's yeah. not a it's thing. Common. No, a lot of people do, because that's the thing. It's like it's like Rocky. Like he doesn't even right. win in the first movie. It's the thrill of the fight. It's like what it took right. to get there. Yeah. And when you become an Olympian, like you're part of history. It's that's the big stage, you know. So winning and and getting the medals is for sure the icing on the cake and what everybody wants. But just to go is like insane. You mm-hmm. you, you join history, and so you kind of learn a lot about that when you go and so um so i see a lot of people that like they're so proud they get their rings wow. tatted because you have tattoos like, you have a few yeah you, yeah. Just, you, you opted it. out for the rings yeah yeah it's so funny like they're trademarked so yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i'd have like, to get approval of yeah, it. <laughs> you see somebody with the olympic rings tattooed on them like oh no way dude you're an olympic medalist and like oh no i was just in the olympics but <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Went, <laughs> yeah. I went to sachi oh yeah, i was there bro like oh no i just went and checked no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure and you yeah. put it on your neck huh yeah. interesting uh-huh. yeah <laughs> where, uh, where where do you spend most of your time these days you know i bounce around a ton that was my thing is after the olympics i told my girlfriend i was like let's just go like, let's go do the stuff that i didn't have the time to do or like yeah. w- if i was normally supposed to be in in some icy cold place you know training let's go to the beach somewhere and do something sick or let's surf so yeah love surfing so i was named sean after sean thompson uh, okay pro south african surfer uh dad loves surfing and so um so yeah i try to i try to get waves where i can but we went on this like tour i mean we we basically costa rica we went to cabo to antarctica to indonesia wow. to switzerland maldives Dubai. I mean, we we just kind of just been going all wow. over and checking these things off the list. It's been so much fun. So how did you get to Antarctica? Did you go by plane or did you do the uh, the route by ship? Man, it was it was such an insane trip. We got really spoiled. Our our buddy, um, you know, we ended up taking his plane down to the, like the southernmost of Chile, Argentina. tip of Chile. Yeah. yeah. Well, we were in Argentina and then to Chile because you got to wait for the weather pattern to. You know, come it's through. a special plane to get there, right? The, well, so we, yeah, we got off that and got on the special plane to get to Antarctica. And there's nothing down there. There's no town. There's it's just science research facilities, right? You know, and so it's like being on Mars. Yeah, and I never That's wanted funny. to go there or thought to go there, but when this came up, and I was like, oh my god, we got to do this. And so from there, we got on this boat, and then the boat takes you around, and you like go on excursions to see whales and penguins. And and the crazy part was, is that the ship we were on had a helicopter. And they're like, well, do you want to go snowboard? I was like, shit, yeah. So we ended up like, (laughs) you know, and and, uh, of course I'm like the luckiest dude ever. It snowed the night before we were going to go ride. And we got this amazing like powder day in Antarctica. I was like once in a lifetime sort of thing. Because I asked the guy, I was like, what is, what's the snow like? He's like, it's pretty hard pack. It's not great. You know, it's more just to say you did it, but we lucked right. out. I had this like really fun day on the mountain oh, that's so sick. Um, and you like come riding down to the bottom and there's just like penguins and shit on the beach. Wow. And like, yeah, there's, if you check out um, my Instagram, it's just Sean White. Um, I got some pretty fun videos cause uh, uh, Lewis Hamilton, the uh, F1 driver became a friend and he came on the trip as well. And you talk about the competitive, mindset and the mentality like he watched me do this long sort of pond skim this like frozen like just the water's so cold down there and he watched me like skim over this thing he's like i gotta do it so he went down and he tried it and fully ended up sinking in the middle of this thing he's like anybody normally (laughs) at that point would leave and he's like i'm doing it he like frozen he's like (laughs) like walking back up gets to the top does it again and nails it you know so you kind of see um you know, some, yeah. some fun stuff. But that trip was, yeah, it was nuts. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm always curious what percent of the, of the population has been to Antarctica. Yeah. 
got to be less than one percent. No, because yeah. it's like it's not nobody can really... say they've been to all seven continents. Yeah, I mean nobody I know except we've, for you that yeah. Steve we, Wozniak. We, yeah, we've been uh, we've been dying to do that, man. Do oh yeah, off do an iceberg. it, do it. Yeah, yeah. it's we've, it's a special place, and the sun never really goes down. It just kind of it just turns into this beautiful sunset, and this it just keeps going, and you're like, oh, it's really she's still giving her this the, I, the colors, and then all of a sudden it just turns into this epic sunrise. And it then, just uh, never gets dark. Yeah. And then the other part of the year just never gets sunlight. Yeah, just... yeah, that's you know. How, but, how many times have you seen the Northern Lights? <laughs> I think only like once, but it was faint. That's something I actually want to go back and check out. But I did, I did go surfing in like the Arctic Circle up there, um, and I was, I was very young. Just to say, I did it. My, my, my wetsuit had a big hole in it. It was like a hand me down, and I was freezing but i you know there we go you do Jed's some pretty, uh, on instagram man there we go check me out yeah dude um i, I will check that everybody follow sean white on instagram <laughs> how do you find him sean white yeah. sean white dude. s-h-a-u-n sean white. Yeah. yeah easy <laughs> and uh yeah dude man what how rad dude. i feel like we, we should we should cut you loose but this has yeah. been so epic dude mm-hmm. yeah man and, fun chatting um, the uh are you happy Sean? yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i can truly say i'm i'm good yeah you know what i don't think i'm not gonna go as far as to say i'm happy i'm gonna say my life is really good you say yeah. it's a piece of shit yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah my 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 life is is really good yeah. like I, i'm i'm uh I'm stoked on how much stuff is going on, how much I'm working on, and I just want to keep working on it and make yeah. it bradder. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, the the realization that like I can be good right now and still go for these things was the huge weight lifter. Right. Where I'm like, oh, I can be thrilled because I thought it was a weakness before. I'm like, oh, if I say, like you said, it's laziness. If I say that I'm good, then then how am I going to motivate to go get this thing that I think will make me happy in the end? And, and then I realized I was like, well, wait, if I can just be happy right now and like appreciate what I have and enjoy this process, now I'm enjoying it and I'm, I'm even more motivated because I'm having fun doing it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, so. when the, the guy who wrote Think and Grow Rich, <clears throat> Napoleon Hill interviewed like hundreds of billionaires back in the 1900s. Okay. And he said like the one thing that he saw that they had there, there are, are a lot of them because they had all the money in the world to do whatever they wanted. Mm. And he said, almost all of them didn't have peace of mind. Mm. So he's like, the goal of these people were to get peace of mind, and no, none of them ever had that. So yeah, it was, well, that's yeah. why they were well because they had no, no, because yeah. they had they had so much money. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but they had so much money that that towards the end of their life they didn't know how to get rid of the money that wouldn't curse the next person. Oh, that's why yeah. they started doing libraries and universities in Carnegie Just Hall. Like, yeah, because they're like, I, there's no way I'm going to give this money to my kids because it's such a burden to like have that oh, much responsibility yeah. that yeah, they your practically mom said money ruins. Life. Lives. Fam- families, families. families. Yeah, yeah, she was so worried about it. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, you, you don't want to deprive, like, you know, for me to win that contest and, like, buy my first car, like, buy my first house. It's like, those are huge. If you're just handed that from yeah. your parent, and you're like, oh, cool. Well, you see what happens to the I kids. Do, that I, I got, you know, you don't, like, what? where's that excitement to strive for something, right. to earn something, to feel that accomplishment? And, like, for sure. You know, it took those those horrible crashes and lessons and those things and falling out with people, all these things to, you know, get to where I'm at today to be, you know, in a, in a good peace of mind and, and all that. So that's, what's hard is like watching the doc. You're like, fuck, I, I would love to go back and change sure. these things, but Hey, you know, God, that's if life. I would never have lost that thing, I would never have found right. this gem and, and it's brought me a lot of contentment in life. So it's kind of hard to like, you know, factor all that in when you're watching and going through it <laughs> everybody watch the last run mm-hmm. on max mm-hmm. you gotta watch it is it the same is that where uh tony hawk's documentary is i want to say yeah. yeah i mean i think he launched hbo and then it got folded in right, right, so right, yeah right. but but similar God, sort yeah, was of that thing. was yeah. that a crazy one man yeah i mean he mentioned to me i hope i'm allowed to share this um that he he wasn't as involed you know yeah. He was like, "Look, you know, do do your thing." I, I mean, I believe because it's it. a tough thing to do. It's really weird, he, you know. He got very, very uh, vulnerable mm. in that. Oh, for like, sure. I, I, I don't know that the Tony Hawk's documentary could have been so vulnerable mm-hmm. and so 
uh, exposed mm -hmm. if he was really involved. So yeah. I think that that, that that documentary probably benefited a great deal from him yeah. kind of taking a There was seat. a certain point where I just cut it off, too. I was like, look, like... I just wanted to make sure I'm like the trick name's got to be right. You can't be showing right. me surfing this wave, and all of a sudden I'm on a different yeah. wave going the other way. You know, right, there's crummy right, right, edits. Right. So I was like, it's got to be right, and so I, I weighed in on a lot of that stuff, and then I just left him with like a hey, you know, the fact that I you know I gave him like three or four things. It's like this person was really important. He should have a bigger role. Right. We talked about Jake Burton, the uh, yeah. owner of Burton Snowboards, and kind of the father of you know, snowboarding and. And I was like, he's got to be in there. We got to really touch on the skateboarding career a bit more because yeah. that was such a huge part of my life and career. And then, and, you know, and a few other things. And I was like, but, and I'm done. So when I watched it, when it came out, it was actually the first time I really watched yeah. the whole thing. And yeah. I was pretty hyped that they did such a great job. So, it's yeah. epic, man. Yeah. So, yeah. And Backcountry is the name of the the company, is that right? Uh, uh, Backcountry is a distributor for uh, our, our outerwear for I, White Space. I just space. saw that on your Instagram. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, so yeah. they make all the clothes and stuff for us and help us distribute and market and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. then the snowboards is kind of on our own. It was a way to like go like i know snowboards in and out like i want to make sure that these boards like ride perfect and the edges are great and the materials and like yeah. so i basically took my olympic board and like broke it into three different models um nice. one for powder one for park and like half pipe and all terrain and then and then we worked with this company to help develop uh the outerwear you know all the jackets and mm -hmm. all the gear you wear but that's where you can go get get the gear but it's called white space yeah all right white space yeah sean white on instagram <laughs> the last run on max yeah we go <laughs> there you, you should come cool. over to my house and skate my i would love to i'd <laughs> love to hit me sure. up i got yeah, time i'm retired baby. dude i love it <laughs> hey, yeah thanks this was yeah, epic dude. This thank, is you, so much. thank you guys super fun there you have it ladies and gentlemen my new bro sean white i mean how rad is that? I'm going to invite him over to skate my huge ramp in the backyard. Um, we'll see. He's just really a rad skater. And his show on Max, The Last Run, is really rad, too. I genuinely recommend everybody watch it. And I'm genuinely grateful to everybody who stuck around to the very end. You know I love you, my beautiful street team. Thank you. Always. And... Uh, what, what can I say? What's going on? I'm going back on tour this uh, this week, or next week I leave for, for the, the final shows of the Bucket List Tour. Um, I, I talked about it. I bought the property, and we got 44 acres. So epic. I love you guys. Thanks so much. That's it. <laughs>